Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Krasinski, and on behalf of all of my colleagues at Book Forum, I want to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Pulitzer Prize winning author Marco Jefferson and writer filmmaker Blair McClendon. The occasion for tonight's talk is the publication of Margot's recent memoir, Constructing a Nervous System, which Blair reviewed for the magazine. And although we at Book Forum know it's a bit unusual to pair an author with their critic for a conversation, when presented with two such formidable minds, we couldn't resist. And in fact, this conversation is the first in a new series titled Off the Page, for which we will be placing writers face to face with their critics. So stay tuned for more on that. Uh, before I welcome Margot and Blair into our Zoom room, I just wanted to share one housekeeping note with all of you. After they wrap up their conversation, there will be time for questions from you, the audience, and you can submit your questions at any time during the event, either with the Q&A button, sort of via that Q&A button in your Zoom window, uh, or if you prefer, just via the chat. I'll collect the questions throughout the night and then later present them on your behalf to Margot and Blair. So now to introduce our guests. Uh, Margot Jefferson, of course, is the winner of a Pulitzer Prize for Criticism and previously served as book and arts critic for Newsweek and the New York Times. Her writing has appeared in, among other publications, Vogue, New York Magazine, The Nation, and Guernica. Her memoir, Negroland, received the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, and she is also the author of On Michael Jackson and is professor of writing at Columbia University School of the Arts. Blair McClendon is a writer, editor, and filmmaker, filmmaker whose writing has appeared in N Plus One, The New Republic, The New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, Book Forum, and elsewhere. His film work spans documentary and fiction and has played at Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, and other festivals around the world. So with that, I want to thank you all again for coming, and please join me in welcoming Marco Jefferson and Blair McClendon. Hello. Hey, Marco. Thanks, hey, Jennifer. Um, so I'll, I'll get right into it. Uh, I'm going to start with a slight apology because I'm going to quote you back to yourself, uh, mm. which I know is never pleasant. Um, <laughs> it's like hearing <laughs> yourself on a tape recorder. Mm. <laughs> uh, there's a piece from a while ago, not from Constructing a Nervous System. Um, I think it was a review of the Museum for African Art where you'd said, there's always a tension between how we respond when we know little or nothing about the work and how we respond when we're armed with prior knowledge or swathed in curatorial directives. Um, and the reason I was thinking about that in this is I was wondering how the process was different for you in doing a second memoir, if that sort of figures in with you that people are coming armed with some of that prior knowledge or prior knowledge that you are armed with from the process of having written that first one, what sort of does that look like to go back over some of the same terrain again? Yeah, um, it looks, whenever it looked boring, meaning I felt, okay, I'm, I'm restating and trying to make the prose better, but you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to improve the form and it's lagging because the content is not taking me anywhere new. Um, I, would, I would scratch that. Um, I did not ever want to think of this as a kind of sequel um, to Negro Land. I mm -hmm. realize it's a cousin, it's a descendant, um, but um, I wanted to do two things. One, really, take up aspects of, um, of, call them subjects, call them feelings, call them stories that I knew had been eluding me that had, you know, slipped into a parenthesis or kind of just slipped out. Oh, my father, he's gone. <laughs> I'm writing about my mother again. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that I, I wanted to do. And I also just, I wanted to try, um, I wanted to go at material that I just hadn't before. Maybe I'd written about it, you know, like, yes, I reviewed um, in fiery feminist fashion um, Tina Turner's memoir. <laughs> you know, yes, a lot of these, these um, figures and, and subjects I've written at and around and of, but I wanted to, um, to re-engage them. And it really had to do with um, the, the intimacies of memoir. Um, 
being um, the prompts for writing that appeared to be based in criticism. Um, and also the reverse. Um, you know, the I wanted the root and the sources um, often. Many, there are always many sources. We're not allowed to say origin, <laughs> just origin or one source yet. But, you know, I, I wanted to reveal those, those in, in, intricate intimacies that we all have. You know, we're always, we've got our personal culture. And when you're a critic, that, these irrational, you know, obsessions and needs and even the things you're embarrassed about because you're supposed to have perfect taste if you're a critic. Um, you know, those are always interfering with, intervening with, coloring in interesting ways, you know, your official formal voice. So I really wanted to find every way possible to get past those formalities and to, to tell a, an autobiographical story in ways with means that didn't always appear to be, like, you know, your relationship with your parents, you know, <laughs> immediately the material for memoir. And Thinking about sort of that official formal voice, something that's like so remarkable here, I think in the memoir form, I, well, I guess you put it as sort of the intimacies of that is that it doesn't give into, I think, the really easy sort of like teleology or triumphalism of a lot of memoirs, where once you get to the end, it's like, and every choice was a good choice. <laughs> here I am, aren't you happy? I'm here on the last page with you, right? Yeah, how did, how did you sort of bring that critical aspect of yourself and your own work to this question of how do you then retell something you are the most intimate with being your own story where we still see you sort of the character of your past self as somebody who could be multiple people rather than that sense of it's driving towards this moment on this Zoom call. Well, I think in for this book, these um, almost obsessive encounters that I kept having with, you know, a Bud Powell record, an Ella Fitzgerald record with, um, you know, Nat Cole with um, <laughs> Marvin Gaye with W.E.V. Du Bois and George Eliot, you know, if, in that way, it, it, it's, it is like, like theater or performance, whoever you're mm -hmm. encountering alters something in you know, who you, in how you're presenting yourself and how you're thinking of yourself um, in tone of voice, in, um, you know, an approach. Yeah, in, in general approach. So that had a lot to do with it. Just, you know, pushing um, to, <laughs> pushing to disperse myself um, among all mm -hmm. these figures and to, I wanted them to live. That's also why I, I think of this book as more theatrical. So I had to commit energy to bringing them alive, not just as one often does in a piece of criticism, you know, I'm recreating the sensory, I'm telling the story again, but really trying to, to you know, make the page this, a kind of stage. Did that, that dispersal and that sort of performance was that natural to you? Is that concerning to you? Just I'm thinking again of sort of like how much of the work of the critic is really being like it is, you know, it is X, and it's like a full stopped sentence. Was getting into that sort of more recursive form and that that dispersal you said like worrisome for you, troubling for you? Um, worrisome. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it worried me every minute of every day. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know what worrisome and, and, and troubling, you're being generous, you're giving me lots of room to define them. Um, it scared me. It didn't worry me be, uh, anymore be, since I'd written Negro Land. Mm -hmm. So I knew I couldn't progress with Negro Land until I realized that, you know, being a critic was as acute a part of my identity as being, you know, um, a daughter, you know, <laughs> a black. <laughs> women post boom, you know, post, um, <laughs> post World War II in Chicago, you know, Chicago in a particular time, historically. Um, and I realized, okay, you know, this has shaped you as much as any of the other materials we, we bring to um, self-knowledge or sessions with psychoanalysts and, and whatever. Um, and that helped me enormously to, to, to know I could bring that along. Um, and, and kind of expand it. You know, I realize I'm slightly losing. You were asking me about this being worrisome or troublesome. Um, um, I got excited by it finally, because it turned out 
Um, sometimes being a critic can feel, you know, as if you're imposing certain prohibitions, you know, right? Of, <laughs> um, of tone and taste. And uh, though you're trying that, yeah, you are. Certain prohibitions, they may be to a good end, as you say, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, and to feel that um, I had the materials partly through questioning, going back and looking at again, even if not questioning, just trying to disassemble. <laughs> oh, this is the, this is the portrait, you know, um, let's take it apart and let's try to render it in another more fractured style. Um, that became, it never stopped being troubling, troublesome and hard, but it, it, it was very interesting. It gave me more of a sense of possibility rather than being um, confined fully you know, to the, um, the self on the page that I knew very well. So I want to get in a bit to some of these uh, subjects, I think, as, as you put it, that are in there. And there's one that, one of the ones that really stopped me right away um, when you're talking about Josephine Baker. Uh, you have this part where you say, I get tired of thinking of women like Baker as only divas. We marvel at diva gifts. We ogle and patronize diva excess. But goddesses belong to myth, not history. Um, and I wondered if you could tease out a bit what for you about sort of the diva is the difference between myth and history and how do you sort of separate those for yourself? Yeah, um, the, the less, you know, myth again can be simultaneously um, constantly thrilling and also, oh, here we go again, you know? Um, <laughs> so they're, they're, the rapture part of the myth, my God, I can participate in that, um, you know, tied into that is often in, in exactly the same moment. So the voice becomes just a little condescending of, well, she's a deep. She's such a diva. Um, you know, the, the sense of um, excessive female grandiosity, um, mm -hmm. of taking advantage in some way of, of the, the privileges and the um, worship that you have won, um, you know, of acting out and acting up. Um, and I see, you know, God knows I've indulged in it, but I am, you know, I see that as a way of of confining, uh, you know, and um, tainting a bit the um, the actual achievements. There is, in fact, really interesting work being done by, among other people, um, one of my um, colleagues, the poet and critic Deborah Paradis, on divas. That's really digging into the 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 style acquisitions, the work ethics, the the symbology mm. that they, you know, really, really power through in, in thoroughgoing, you know, almost dogged ways, um, you know, so that their meaning for a community, um, you know, escapes this kind of, oh, we're all, we're all just, we're all smitten and suckered. Um, so, um, you know, I think now I think I was being a little bit Maybe it was, a, since I didn't know so much interesting work was coming forth, on Jesus, <laughs> I felt maybe, I feel like maybe I was being a teeny bit flippant. I agree with my critique, but I <laughs> acted as if my tone kind of suggested that, well, I'm, you know, I'm very aware of this and I'm not sure other people are. But I did, um, you know, it was one of the ways that Josephine Baker um, really, th for about the last 40, 30, 40 years of her life got, patronized even as she was being, um, you know, kind of honored, exalted, spoken of in, in, glory, in glamorous ways. But it was a way, it's a, it's a way also to patronize, to make someone look like um, a self-serving dilettante in some ways, you know, a lot using charisma somewhat um, manipulatively. Yeah. Right, you'd said it was it wasn't that dissimilar from the history of female hysterics. Exactly. Oh, I did say that. Oh, good. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a little more digging in than I, than I remember. <laughs> yeah. No, I no, I think that's true. And even with the female hysteric, there's a certain oh, you know, there's there's that that fascination that they hold, and there is a kind of weird charisma if you're a hysteric, and also the the craft, the hard mm -hmm. hard work that goes into the craft, the art, um, tends to get a little, you know, throw, you know chiffoned out, mm -hmm. <laughs> chiffoned and sequined out. <laughs> Do you think there's a way for these kinds of performers to step outside of that? Or is that sort of, 
is the sort of common power of myth just too big for them as the performer to actually get outside of? Is that sort of the critic's position to do? Um, you know, not necessarily. I mean, I'm actually going to ask you to help me with this. Um, <laughs> there are, you know, to me, finally, I'm measuring it by how, how, how the work, how the art is developing. And if mm -hmm. you're absolutely stuck and repeating yourself, then you're trapped. You know, and playing this, let's say the same songs, doing mm -hmm. exactly the same, turning your body in exactly the same way in that dance that you know, you know, <laughs> will get the crowd screaming. Um, then you're then you're trapped in it. You know, mm. then you need the rapture, the worship, the audience more than you need, um, you know, your art. But you know, even with Baker, you know, she kept finding alternative ways to. Mm -hmm to push herself, to develop herself as she aged, you know, as certain opportunities closed off, um, you know, she would reconstruct um, everything from old, you know, costumes and, and dances that she could still, that she would make look good when she was 70, you know, <laughs> uh, she'd find a way, you know, she wouldn't do the foolish ones. She'd find a way to make, you know, instead of coming on in bananas, she'd come on in, um, you know, kind of motorcycle gear on a, you know, <laughs> and ride it, ride a motorcycle on the stage. So, you know, and she showed up, bless her heart, she appeared at the Civil Rights um, March on Washington in the uniform of the free French. Mm -hmm. Now that's a way of saying, you know, yeah, I'm a star, I'm a warrior, you know, I'm yours, I'm also a foreigner, you know, I've done things you can't imagine, I'm here mm -hmm. with you. I guess this is me thinking, I, mean, I, I wouldn't really say opposite, but... Uh, Oh, you might. <laughs> <laughs> well, I almost did. I came very close. Uh, but yeah. well, the other the other performer who I like really, th although it's the book is full of them, um, who really feels sort of counter in what their myth is is Ike Turner, um, and that's one that reading the book was like thrilling in the sense of. I just didn't expect any critic at it right now to be like. Here's why Ike Turner is great. Uh, I, well, I also grew up listening to it. <laughs> he does. Well, it's it's stuff. Well, the reason I was well, thrilled by it, it is I also grew up hearing that music. Hmm? You did grow up hearing that. Yeah, music. I also grew up hearing that music, and it is one of those things where that was so exciting to me because I was seeing somebody wrestling with the place of the person. Yes, from the vantage point of the position now, but not disavowing what was the position in real time. Yes. Uh, Yes, yes. Which I just feel like right now is really a difficulty in criticism is to, for as much as people are saying, oh, the real difficulty is separating the art for the artist. I feel like what people are struggling with is separating themselves from it and seeing what they felt then and now and that yes. there might not be a line between them. And how did- And acknowledging, oh, your, oh the sentimentalities, the needs, the absolutely, okay, I'm besotted, <laughs> you know? You, kept, you pointed out, you shocked me by pointing out how often I used, I'm in for all <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, I think that's right. Our own um, stories, um, our own coming of age with all these, these figures is, um, it's in many ways, you know, it's, it can be an embarrassing story. It's, it's part of the stuff we tend to hide. Um, and to, for the sake of, again, if we're critics, but also if you're writing a short, you know, there's certain things you always shape. You're writing a short story, a novel, you, you make choices. And in some way they, can, they are often brave, but often they are also kind to, your, to parts of yourself that are just too shameful that you 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 haven't wrestled with enough in terms of what what craft you've got. Hmm. So what what brought you then? But did, to I did, did want to ask, and this may still show that um, I'm a little bit maybe squeamish about uh, here, here I am, me and Ike. <laughs> um, 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 did you feel I was saying he was great as opposed to? Uh, well, I guess this is going to require important central. <laughs> I'm, I'm well, picking. yeah, I don't think I, I guess, <laughs> and to everyone listening, uh, by great, I meant as a performer. Uh, yeah, actually, I think he could be. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I as don't. As obviously was she. I, a couple of people have said, yes, you're taking Tina for granted. I'm not 
not taking Tina for granted. Right? <laughs> I I will tell you, I did not think that you thought Tina Turner was a poor performer. That's not what I took away from it. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, but no, I don't. I don't think what I got from it was a sense that you thought he was great. Full stop. No further questions. Um, but worth wrestling with, worth like, worth no, wrestling worth, with, and worth taking pleasure in. Yeah. Those well, it's were great. Both of them were great. Even they were great. The records. Cats were great. <laughs> yes. It's why I I was like so. Why I tied like in in my brain while reading it the writing about Ike Turner and about Willa Cather. Um, that was so interesting that you did that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's just like there's an easy way, for similar, I mean, not the exact, but similar reasons to just fully disavow any wrestling with either of them. Um, and I guess this is, I mean, this is a question you, know, you said earlier, your, your position as a, a critic is as important as your position as a daughter and all of these things. Um, but I wondered, especially for the Willa Cather section, if you could talk, about, talk a bit about how your position as a teacher sort of inflected how you wrestle with these things, because that whole section is really staged around the question of teaching. Yes. Um, how did that sort of influence how you wrestled with these? Um, it gave me, well, for, you know, first of all, it was first, you know, th th this was recorded experience, you know. <laughs> I couldn't escape the, the various chapters, you know, whereby I mm -hmm. didn't wrestle and then decided <laughs> I had to wrestle and then chose to wrestle, um, you know, and I couldn't disavow, you know, recollections of nervousness, embarrassment, um, anger, um, you know, all those kinds of things, um, competitiveness even, you know, with, with, it, with my students, um, feeling I needed to be utterly powerful and had to do that at all costs. Um, and also um, when you are, you know, very, when you're forced towards kinds of um, ambivalence um, and contradiction, you know, if you, hate parts of the text and love parts of the text, you're in major con contradiction, <laughs> you're ready to work it out, but there you are. Um, you lose, it, 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 you, you, you have to find other sources um, as it, and I was writing as a teacher, you're right, and as a critic, other sources of authority. They can't reside in this smoothed out, you know, bronze surface of, um, of certainty and of, you know, the, 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 the bumpy story is behind us. I stand before you fully mm -hmm. achieved in terms of my relationship to this text. Um, so it was, um, it taking it from the point of view of teaching gave it absolute legitimacy in my mind because you know I do believe passionately um, as much as being as a teacher as, 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 as being a critic in you know, pushing, encountering, um, finding ways um, to, um, to, to engage with the, the ugly, the raw, the raw and the cooked, <laughs> the sublime and the repellent. Um, so it did give me a certain legitimacy that, that a stand, you know, a cultural mm -hmm. stand um, and a certain, um, certain kind of authority. Um, I mentioned Toni Morrison, you know, and her encounters with Catherine with other, um, mm -hmm white writers um, and other texts. I differentiate myself from her, but that also in certain ways gave me um, a kind of license um, mm -hmm. to depart, you know, but also to, um, to claim, yeah, there, there is this lineage whereby we are engaging with these antagonistic and yet and fascinating um, texts that were and this is more true for me than for Morrison with Safira and the Slade Book, that were a part of one. You know, they were. When you loved a book, when mm -hmm. you, um, you know, gave yourself over to it. Um, and for a time, as I did, really kind of squashed down, blocked mm -hmm. out, you know, the parts that were genuinely ugly um, and, and disturbing. Uh, you know, you, 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 there you are, <laughs> you know, love must speak its name, right? Um, <laughs> the love that dares to speak its name and, you know, but this business of finding a language, um, word by word, sentence by sentence, inflection by inflection, you know, whereby 
um, the hated, the the feared, the the ang you know the the toxic um, you know could cohabit somehow with um, things yeah. that were glorious and striking. Yeah, it's just it, it was hellishly hard, but super interesting because I know I have to keep doing this as a writer, as a teacher, as a as a person in the world. One has to keep finding ways to do this. Yeah, I mean, it just that was. I, I'm thinking a bit about what you said about sort of other sources of authority, um, mm. because I think what was really remarkable to me in that section is I know in talking to some other writers too, it's like there's this. Uh, well, you you had the phrase the ease of contempt, uh, where one of the sources of authority it feels like often in these situations is the contempt one has for whomever is failing politically. Yes. Uh, and the pleasure that yeah. it can give you because it is a kind of revenge in a, yeah. setting, in a setting like this where, you know, where race, gender, um, these terrible hierarchies of power and, and dismissiveness are operative. It can feel just exquisitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I can't think of like, it seems lovely to be like, I will remove Willa Cather from the world now. Yeah, we like that. <laughs> Be she's gone. gone because I said she's bad. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, we I just... all have our gallery, our cabinet of those whom it is very hard to forgive, if not all, all across the board, at least at that moment. At that mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. But that's, I think that's why I'm, I like keep coming back to this sort of Ike and Willa pairing. I see. It. Because I, see it. I think on both, on both charges that are sort of being levied against them. It's like, okay, well, these, these are some unforgivable thoughts here or actions in some instances. Um, and with Willa, I just, it's, it's really remarkable to me the way you found that language, like you were just saying, where you have sort of avoided just pure contempt. Um, and I guess I'm wondering over the course of your career, um, you know, I don't think Willa Cath is the first time that question has arisen. Uh, how do you sort of, how do you, the word isn't really check, but it's sort of, there's, there's the ease of contempt. And there's also, it feels like in some cases, like an expectation of anger from black writers about thing that's bad. Um, there is some white writer who has done something bad. Uh, how have you sort of avoided sort of the simplicity of that anger that it feels like in some cases, this is me projecting, but has become counterproductive because sort of black anger can be swallowed now, um, can be readily readily recognized. Okay, we're in we're um, in a certain way we're inoculated. We can take it in, we can recognize it, but we can we can stand, we can handle it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's where I thought the will. Here it comes. Here going. it comes again. Can yeah. Sometimes people respond. Oh, okay. Yeah. All, all various ways of of being proper. You know, I'm 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 progressive. I'm intellectual, <laughs> yet keeping keeping that distance, achieving it. You know, I haven't. God, I've been writing. For, I haven't always. I mean, I've been struggling to get the right tone for ages. <laughs> but there are a lot of right tones. I have certainly, um, on occasion, just um, partly because it was fun to do. Partly because I genuinely felt this needed to be done. You know, this is a despicable. Yeah. You know, let's say I, I'm writing about some cultural trend. You know, this is a this is a despicable. Um, I remember when I was at the Times, I was always taking pot shots at people who were taking pot shots at, you know, PC language mm -hmm. such and such. Um, so I think um, the occasion, the text, um, they they pretty much at the politics around you, but also the aesthetic debates going on around you. They mm -hmm. will. Um, you know, your sense of, of uh, the here and now in history and what your values are. They, they'll, that will, that will shape your tone. Um, it keeps, it keeps changing. It also depends on what's the magazine, what's the length of the piece, how many <laughs> it is. Sometimes I have just said, I, no, I don't want to, I can't do that. I can't figure out how to, how to get at it. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to, which I'm not so proud of, you know, I'd rather have tried on, a, on more occasions. There's, um, what, I mean, you know, what do you, what, what about you? You write a lot of very strong-willed um, criticism. <laughs> um, 
how do I do it? Yeah, what, how do you, how do you moderate, moderate, modulate, go full blown, you know, shoot those <laughs> volleys and, and <laughs> arrows, um, yeah. Um, I would love to say that I have, you know, some really well thought out principle, uh, but I think it tends to, I mean, it, it is the situation. I think, you know, yeah. when there's millions in the streets, then I'm more willing to just be like, I'm mad at this thing and I think it should not exist. Yeah, uh, and I'm and I'm with them millions. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, there's like other moments where that's that's less the sort of immediate burn because that's not what I was doing all night before. You know, sending this piece off to somebody. Um, it's also what other you know, critics, writers, scholars, reviewers. You know, they are our peers. It's also what they're saying. So yeah. if you feel. Oh boy, everybody's, you know, taking exactly the same tone, whether it, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. of worship or of rage, um, then you have to start. The temptation is to do that, but that's when you also, that can be a very good prompt for, hmm, is something else not, what's not being said? Mm. What's not being said? And let me try to think of a way to, if I discover that, to say it. <laughs> Does that... I mean, Which is that, not that's just of... virtuous. That's also, you know, we want to be read because we want to be. Yeah. <laughs> think our minds are, are original and fresh, right? So the yeah. ego is operating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just I wonder then. That's I'm, I'm I'm really struck by you saying like about a similar tone there, um, because I think there's sort of a way of thinking about criticism relative to some sense of like dissent. Um, but what you've just expressed is kind of a slightly more complicated one there where it's not just, you know, dissent against the world as it is, but against a sort of, uh, you know, the herd chasing a particular tone, a particular line of thought. Um, especially if it's, well, it, not just especially. It, um, if it's a herd about which you have mixed feelings, but again, your peers are in the, that's easier. If the herd is, you know, oh mm -hmm. God, you know, com com comprises all these really smart people you look up to and you <laughs> still have reservations, then that's another thing you have to struggle with, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, this, that feels like it gets, it gets a bit back to this myth and history thing in the sense of, um, I think it's very easy and isn't done in constructing a nervous system, but to take sort of these I'll use diva as a genderless term, but diva in the like long tradition of big black performers dancing across history in the stage. Usually, uh, if you, we don't use diva for, haven't for men. Now we yeah. can, but we haven't from, so you're speaking historically of women. Yeah. yeah. And that they are taken and once, often after they're dead, they're, they have reached the moment of being celebrated. That's the line full stop on them. Um, and, you know, you get this, the, the injunction to a positive depiction. Um, and what's, and what's also quite interesting. If they're, if they're Black women, um, there can also be certain stylistic confines. This is what constitutes a true yeah. Black diva. This is the style. This is the, this is the tradition from which she comes. Um, that's not true. Again, Baker kept herself a moving target in yeah. all ways, but, you know, that was also further back in history, I know what you're talking about. Um, you know, sir, yeah, yeah, the, the funky, earthy soul. So yeah, world. and you get- Tends to be the most worshiped these days, yeah. Yeah, and you, you have this, I don't know, it's the, it's the sort of, it's the positive question that always, always strikes me and that I think is handled well here. I mean, I think about the, the section of Bud Powell who I also just really love. So I was like, yes, people talking about Bud Powell. Uh, but, <laughs> um, but you don't you don't really depict him as just you know you do, I mean the, the opposite of it it's not here's the man who conquers the world through the force of music, um, but here's a man who struggled and gave us this music. Um, yeah, I guess that, I think you compared to Theseus in there, um, but That's where you're like why wasn't he Theseus? Right, exactly. Why did he? Why did it? Why did he come out as the Minotaur? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> genius. That's right. That's right. I, I guess I'm wondering sort of how. Once you've once you've identified, you know this this sort of line, um, and you're sort of saying, "Let me take another look at that." 
how do you get yourself in a position to, you know, for lack of a better phrase, sort of talk out of turn there and say, well, let's look at these people as they are, as they are in history rather than as they are in myth, when there's so much writing on that. Well, there's a lot of good history writing about, you know, at this point about right. Bud Powell, um, uh, also even about Ella, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, yeah. So in that way, you know, um, I could, I mean, I could draw on that. What I needed, you know, he's he's taken totally seriously um, as an artist. You know, yeah, there can be a little too much, oh, poor Bud, but, um, you know, he's a, the, the precedents are there. I didn't have to come up with those. Um, what I had to do to to make it to make it sound to make, <laughs> make it matter um, was find um, my own um, uh, way into this process of listening mm. over the years to this musician who first excited me when I was a child but was not able to understand you know, <laughs> what was going on. Um, then that child, the combination of working through um, the, 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 the myths that I needed to, um, mm. feel, to feel him and, and you know, to, to imagine him as a girl and the work that's the, the current me that he was actually doing as a pianist. How can those come together? They often mm. do. You know, speak to each other. Then um, my father. Um, you know, it opens out into a story of me and my father, who um, wanted to be um, a musician and became a doctor instead, and was very engaged with with Bud Powell, with others, with <laughs> with other more you know sublimely mm -hmm. blasé um, <laughs> in manner musicians like Ellington. But um, it also he became a kind of conduit to um, um, you know, stories of, of, of a certain kind of black male achievement um, and pain, um, often muted, but, uh, mm -hmm. but very much there and how those entwined also and what kind of understanding that can give you um, for art, but also, you know, again, I, to link him to uh, my father and my father's generation is to give him an, um, an additional history. Yeah, and there's that, I think, if I remember correctly, I might be misremembering the cover of that album. Um, but I think the one that you're like most frequently talking about in there, he also has that sweat across his yes! brow. Yes, yeah, that's what started those that whole thing. It was it was that sweat on his face that I remembered as if it were yesterday, and I call it up on YouTube and just stare at it, pull out my LP and mm -hmm. stare at it. Yeah, and yes, those things are, are they're they're just extraordinary. The the power of those, and then um, my remembering as a child that you know. When, when Bud Powell's intensities, very connected to my father's retreats, became too much, then Ella Fitzgerald was what mm. I returned to. But then that, of course, set up other kinds of complications and, and took one into realizing that there was more to her than, ah, you know, <laughs> she's giving me rest and, lo and loveliness, you know, mm -hmm. so... Everything has its everything has its shadow and its alternate stories. Well, and it feels like you've sort of returned to this question of the sweat, which obviously is inflected differently. And is and Ella's sweat because exactly she, you know, woman wasn't you know Louis Armstrong. Yes, it's gorgeous. Bud Powell, it's rapturous. Yeah, but Ella, ladies, we're it's not too much. She had the burden. She was an artist, but she was supposed to be a respectable black lady. The mm -hmm. sweat is not to be approved of that just means you know you're summoning up those images of black women laborers and this was um, you know this was sh shameful to me as a somewhat coddled spoiled little girl uh, <laughs> so one had to tr track one's way through through that but it was larger than me you know this this obsession with sweat um thinking now about sweat and labor uh <laughs> <laughs> and white handkerchiefs, yeah. And white handkerchiefs. Lewis and uh, Ella, yeah. I was, I was, you know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the end where you're sort of going back through your diaries and thinking of this encounter and then thinking of, you know, sort of people talking about their grandmothers and, and citing their grandmothers and bringing them in and marshalling them. 
um, the great, the great, the epic. Yeah, uh, it's always a grandmother. And yet, giving, which I laughed giving at, into I that because I was mesmerized by her. But yeah, um, and I, I was thinking about sort of that that end section where you're talking about, you know, your grandmother would be asking. Um, have you earned the right to be tired? To be tired, which, came, yes, which came up, which first had come up for me at this um, wages for housework, feminist mm -hmm. conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where one woman had stood up and said, I'm tired for what my grandmama did. And then I had gone home in some hyper self righteous, I now realize clearly, <laughs> you know, uh, not wanting to admit um, how implicated I was, this hyper self righteous. We, we should never claim, you know, um, what our grandmothers have gone through. They've gone through more than we ever possibly could. Um, and then my grandmother emerges um, to haunt me um, in all those ways. Um, this strange combination that, uh, so, you know, she is the black grandmother, even as I'm working against um, yeah. our just being besotted. Maybe it's a little bit like the diva. It's, it's not the, it's, it's what we do with the figure, the kinds mm. of ways in which we maybe simplify it or um, make it um, epic in some slightly, slightly in, not inauthentic, but slightly superficial um, or way. Well, it's, it's, it's that kind of, I mean, other people do it too, but for the purpose of this, I'll say it's that kind of like black triumphalism again, that it's like, yes, here's, yes, here's all the things, but it always ends with, and look where we are now. And look, and look at that figure. Um, yeah. And the figure is more complicated than that. And the figure paid a higher price actually than that triumphalism yeah. suggests. Yeah. 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 I guess it's the triumph does kind of lessen the price that's paid along the way. Because now you can look at it from the vantage point of, well, but you made it. <laughs> like yes, maybe it was worth it. You 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 achieved beyond, you know, you mm -hmm. burst all those barriers and you died at 63 in the face of my grandmother yeah. saying, I'm so tired, so tired. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, this is a a, a broad question, but now sort of from that, now that like double looking back on it that you've done how do you think people earn the right to be tired or are they just tired <laughs> you know what they have the right to sometimes just be tired yeah. um, but i clearly was brought up um as negro land and constructing a nervous system show to um feel that everything um i was and did was supposed to signify something, mm -hmm. <laughs> something grander, something, you know, for forward progress um, of the race, of society, of uh, decency. Now, do I, you know, I've gotten wiser about this than I was, <laughs> but yeah, um, earning the right to be tired means you do, you do all you can with all that you have, with what you've got. Um, you know, you, you, you make use, you take pleasure um, in unexpected ways and you make use of all the reasons. You keep trying to find ways to be interested in, interested by, um, come past, you know, those moments of utter depressive horror when you <laughs> want, to, <laughs> want to give up um, and find ways to stay involved, engaged. These are, these are cliches, but that's, that's what it comes down to, right? Don't you think? What do, yeah. <laughs> what do you do when you, when not to be tired? To, to not or, be to tired. To earn the right, no, to earn the right to be. How do I earn the right to be tired? Um, and maybe, and we haven't yet, because here we are. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, I'm not sure that I do think I've earned the right yet. Uh, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you're right about about some of it, even at, at the risk of of, of cliche. Um, that I think you earn the right through exhaustion and the other sense of exhaustion, where you've gone through it to the end. There is there's nothing left to give. That's really well put. That's that's what I. Yes, that's right. That's it. Um, well, I don't know if they want to turn it over, but I'm going to ask another thing very quick before they do, um, which is, this is just a form thing that I, I meant to ask at the top. Um, 
but I am really intrigued by how you decided to go through using uh, the insertion of quotations from sort of across your interests, um, which I only realized was happening because there's the one from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, which I clocked because I remembered it. And then I uh -huh. suddenly was like, oh, wait, <laughs> how frequently is that happening? Um, nice. How did that sort of sampling or citing or however you want to, to phrase what's happening there, how did you like bring that into this piece and make it such a sort of structural element of it? Well, I announced early on, I, re I hadn't realized till I started to work on this, that this was something I had been doing with long essays, um, like mm -hmm. the Josephine Baker, I'd first started right. with that, which I'd done a few years ago, then something on Michael Jackson for a show in London. But I thought, you know, this is so, this needing, you know, <laughs> to, to permeate and be permeated by the, all these other people's words and, and, and the worlds they summon up. This is, this is, it is, this is like part of my voice. This is as essential as, you know, why you choose um, a verb or an adjective or, or, you know, your sense of, your sense of rhythm. Um, so I announced it um, fairly early on in the book. I said, yeah. you know, I, a little abstractly, I said, you know, I steal, I'm going to steal mm -hmm. people's words. I'm in, I'm in contact with them all the time. And I thought, okay, so that's a dramatic device, you know. <laughs> Look for them, enjoy yourself, and then I I kept using them as um, I call it call and response or call it mm. um, no continuous dialogue um, or and even prompts. You know, some I would say something and then that would prompt me to remember. Let's say, oh, that F. Scott Fitzgerald line. Well, I'm not Fitzgerald, <laughs> but um, so yeah, each would be like a little breadcrumb in, <laughs> in Hansel and Gretel taking you mm -hmm. someplace else. And I, I hoped uh, also I used it to help vary rhythm and tone mm. and to keep the readers um, willing, <laughs> well oiled and, and willing, <laughs> and well oiled like the Ten Woodmen, willing to um, go with whatever peculiar leap um, across race, across gender, across disciplines, across centuries, I was going to go with. I want, it was a way of acclimating readers mm. too, and in, in a way I hope it was entertaining or at least, yeah, provocative or stimulating or, oh, hell, just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> you like that quote, have fun, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I kept having to try it out and try it. And I also had these piles of note cards, you know, mm -hmm. these quotes that I would, I would go through on days when I just mm. felt dead and they would help reinvigorate me. So then I would use some of them to reinvigorate the page, yeah. On the, the note card thing that just made me think, um, did you sort of, I mean, obviously I know revision, 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 but uh, what was the, the sort of thinking for you through how you ordered these pieces? Um, because that's something that I was really sort of thinking about again and again when I was writing about the book was, I kept trying to imagine like, well, if, if you flip these, what happens? If you flip these essays, what happens? Um, I'm just wondering what was, was, was that pretty concrete from the beginning for you that it's like X follows Y follows Z or was that a lot of move back and forth? It and was a lot of moving back and forth because initially, you know, one, I, you know, like Du Bois and George Eliot, it meant one thing to me initially. And then it turned out as I kept going, you know, and to mean something, to mean something quite different. So there was a lot of movement, movement. Um, once I said, I'm going to do this, that really did help me. When, well, once I said I'm good, no, no, that's 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 really quotes. Um, let me think. Um, I guess it, it partly had to do with going further and further into the things that were furthest away from me and wackiest, maybe. I think I started with things that were more familiar, more recognizable, um, and then I moved out to um, the, maybe the, the, the outskirts of town, the, the, the bad neighborhoods. And there, Willa Cather's as bad a neighborhood as Ike Turner. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then and my family, you know, and mistakes they had made. Um, mm -hmm. 
that started with childhood, the, the little pains and difficulties, but then, you know, with Janice Kingslow, it, it ended mm -hmm. up with a real kind of moral, two moral dilemmas, yeah. yeah. All right, I think we are, we're being asked to have a couple questions from Ooh, yeah. Ooh, the audience. Yeah. Just a few. Uh, all right. <laughs> Marco and Blair, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure listening in on you. It felt like eavesdropping or something on your <laughs> conversation. I do have a couple of terrific questions. Actually, this first one from Margo uh, from Anonymous um, Attendee. Thank you. Um, you write in your new book that as a critic, you, and then they quote, want to make your way to the center of American culture and find ways to decenter it. This seems very novel because so many critics seem to write from a position of attempting to establish the center of culture. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm wrong about that, but I do wonder if you could talk about this idea of decentering and why it drives you as a critic. Well, I entered criticism and, and journalism and criticism in the early 70s. So I entered it as um, someone who defined herself as um, <laughs> a young vet, a young participant in the um, New Left, anti-war, um, civil rights that had moved to Black power, um, feminism, Black feminism, um, what we then called gay rights, now we'd say queer liberation. Um, and so all of those were, they were part of, very crucial to what made me. Um, and I entered Criticism in that way, I wanted to decenter the old um, traditional, let's say, basically white, basically male, basically on the whole heterosexual, um, European oriented. I wanted to decenter those. What did that mean? That meant expanding the canon, that meant um, challenging certain assumptions about what great art was, what great art wasn't, what major was, what minor was, um, you know, hierarchies of what was high culture and what was popular culture, those were still, you know, rattling around. I wanted to get at those. Um, so in those, though, you know, in those ways, I was part of a much larger decentering project, you know, that loads, well, that a hearty selection of, um, of, women, minorities, you know, um, queers um, were, you know, were, were all doing, you know, the culture was upending and we were in those ways decentering it and hopefully, you know, not replacing it with just another fixed center. That's really, those were, those were the roots of it. Um, and, you know, because I got a bunch of identities um, and also a lot of genre interests, that is something that has stayed with me. Um, and it's, you know, it's become part of my method. So that's in that way, I hope it's a source of power. Um, I, so I can't just pretend it's selfless. It isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question from Lynn Tillman who says, hi, Margaret. Oh my God, hey Lynn. <laughs> She's here. How is writing time. autobiographically, how has writing autobiographically helped you as a writer? How does it allow you to write differently? She asks. First of all, just literally, it has allowed me to do things that I almost never did in my criticism. Um, scenes, <laughs> uh, lots of drama, um, dialogue, uh, um, quick changes of voice and, and, and point of view in a minute, you know, racketing from first to third person and past to present um, real fast. Um, all of that. So you know, those are all options, choices, excitements. Um, methods and to play, just to play much more um, with, I want to, well, rhythm, vocabulary, let's risk being, you know, really soppy and melodramatic here and see if we can, instead of just cutting it, leaven it with some other tone. Like it just gives you a lot more to, to play with. Um, that segues very nicely into a question from Marcel, who's from Queens. Uh, in the book review, in the book forum review, Blair wrote that in cultural memoir, the author's terrain is more perilous than in personal memoir. Margot, mm -hmm. have you found that to be true in your own work? And if so, how do you navigate it? Um, I love that Blair said that. Um, yeah, I think so. But boy, I really would like to have, I really would like to hobble <laughs> right back <laughs> to you and make you, make you read your words. Um, <laughs> 
it's, you know, I think it's the stakes are higher. Well, wait, is that the phrase you used that the stakes were higher? I think I said that. Yeah, no, I just wanted to try to get the right. Because you are um, responsible, I shouldn't say responsible for, but you are responding to um, not only the, you know, the, the what's driving your personal story, but to the culture, to the world around you. That's history, that's politics, that's um, uh, generations, um, geographies with all sorts of different motives. So you're, you're the lead player at times, and then you are um, maybe the chorus observing, then you are um, the director, um, um, the set designer, um, but you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can't play just one role and you can't only um, satisfy yourself. Um, and your ego has to do, play a lot of tricks. It, <laughs> ego <laughs> really drives a personal memoir. And there's a certain kind of performance of um, egolessness that is just as important to a cultural memoir. I have a question for Blair, actually, from DJ Strew, who asks, how does your work editing films inflect your work as a writer, as an editee, and vice versa? Mm, ah, you. your turn, Blair. <laughs> um, hmm. How does it affect my, I mean, I guess the, like, boring direct answer is that when I'm writing about movies, I think I just have, like, a more direct understanding of what is happening frame by frame. Like um, a piece on documentary you did, yeah. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Yeah, I think there's like, there's some stuff that I'm bringing where I'm just like, well, I just, I know this thing and the way that, you know, any writer that does any other thing might be like, well, whenever I'm talking about this, I happen to know about this thing a lot. Um, I guess in terms of craft and form, um, I don't think this is, unique to cinema. I mean, it's not because I'm about to say the word collage, which is its own form. Uh, but <laughs> is I think that there is some of that in how I conceive of these things. Um, and sort of maybe this is the roundabout way of getting at the, what, what Margot was just saying about you can write scenes is that I think I do sort of think through essays and scenes mm -hmm. uh, and how to put them next to each other. Uh, okay. Who knows if that's correct, but it is the way I tend to do it. That's nice, yeah. And there's one last question. This one's from Margo. One of the inner voices you describe is that of the self-critical monster. And I wonder <laughs> if you could talk about that. Do you draw on that monster in your arts criticism or do you try to silence or at least quiet it in your arts criticism? Um, <laughs> for many years, um, I have, I won't, I have tempered it, you know? It has to be used with tact, the monster. Um, um, now that, it, it, Actually, it started with Michael Jackson that I would draw more on this um, monster being this somewhat aggressive, arrogant, um, you know, driven, driven creature um, whose word and opinion and feeling um, were all. Um, now that I'm, um, yeah, Michael Jackson really was a super useful transition um, for that from what I think of as a more um, decorum um, <laughs> decorum attached um, way of writing. Um, I haven't done nearly as much, um, you know, reviewing essay writing um, since these two books. Um, I, what I hope is that they will, um, you know, keep alive, uh, keep, you know, keep that, those extremities of tones. Here's the, here's the sensitive, astute, you know, <laughs> um, listening um, person and um, you know, here's the, here's the monster consumer who wants certain things out of the experience and lots of other things in between. That's just the monster has to come out at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both so much. This was a real honor and pleasure. Uh, you were so generous with your time and mind. So I wanna thank you. Um, I also want to take just a moment to thank my colleagues, Michael Miller, David O'Neill, Lizzie Harding, Brian Green, Namara Smith, Danielle McConnell, and Kate Koza, all of whom helped put this event together. 
And lastly, I want to thank you, the audience, for joining us this evening and to put in a quick moment to encourage you to subscribe to Book Forum. Here's our latest fresh out of my <laughs> mailbox. Yep. Your support is what keeps Book Forum alive and thriving. And there's a link in the chat if you'd like to subscribe now, or you can always go to bookforum.com and subscribe at your leisure. And I must add, and I should have put in my bio note that I've written for Book Forum. One of the first excerpts from Negroland was in Book Forum. You've so, heard it here, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you, Jennifer and Blair. I really want to thank you. Um, this was so interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank both of you, too. Oh, it's okay. a gift to both of you. Thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one. So take care and goodbye. Good night. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks. It was wild. <laughs>